Good afternoon. Uh, this is a hearing uh, which is being called to order. We are uh, reconvening the Special Committee on Criminal Justice Reform. I'm recognizing a presence of a quorum uh, of this committee. Um, and uh, would are there any opening comments from members of the committee? Seeing none, going once, going twice. Uh, would the clerk please read the title of the resolution? Resolution number 160101, a resolution appointing members to the Special Committee on Criminal Justice Reform, who will conduct public hearings examining the Philadelphia criminal justice system for the impact of current policies and offer recommended strategies for reform that are in the best interests of public safety and the public good. We've done a lot of hearings. I think we're closing in on maybe two dozen of these criminal justice reforms here. And they've taken on various topics, including a bail reform to uh, anti-violence measures. But today, I think we have turned a corner, um, co-chairs and committee members, uh, and are starting to be a little more solution-oriented. And one such solution um, that we've been able to uh, identify uh, is community hubs. And from what I can gather, and I'm gonna do a lot of listening today, uh, is that these hubs are designed with participation from the community in mind uh, for the benefit of justice, for the benefit of the defendant so that the prosecution, uh, the judiciary, and um, uh, the defense can get a better understanding of people, uh, people from the community, um, what they're going through, what um, circumstances they may be uh, coming up with, with a holistic restorative justice point of view, uh, with a holistic uh, reparations by way of how they pay their debt to society, but also, uh, as my young kids would say, how you can get your life right. And here are the resources to do that. So I'm excited uh, about this opportunity. Um, and with me on the committee, I'm gonna get the list in front of me so that, so uh, to my far left, I think we have the, yes he is, the district attorney uh, who is uh, a member of this committee and we're glad to have him. Do you have any opening remarks? No? All right. Um, myself, Keir Bradford Gray is supposed to be here. She, hello. <laughs> See, we're we'll going to have to make her wear a bell. Um, Kevin Bethel is not here. Julie Wertheimer is here. Uh, Wilfredo Rojas is here. Um, Miss Richards is here, I see. Um, Richard uh, McSorley, my good friend, is here, and Larry Krasner, I mentioned, and newly minted committee member Judge DeLeon. Welcome all. Thank you. All right, with that, will the clerk please read? Yo, yeah, I, that's what I asked twice. Yes. So with my co-chair, uh, Ms. Gray, please give some remarks. Sorry. Thank you so much, Councilman, and um, good afternoon, everyone. First, I wanna thank the special committee for uh, exploring the opportunity to understand what's going on in the community, and I call it the community's response to criminal justice reform. Uh, early on in my career as a public defender, I was going into court trying to fight the battles and trying to get just outcomes by myself. And I realized time after time that the decisions that were being made weren't based on policies, but it was based on the level of understanding that people had about individuals who came from, through the system based on the fact that we didn't have a lot of information to share about the human and where they came from. So what I see this as is criminal justice reform at its finest. Criminal justice reform is not just a policy, it's not a legislative act, but it's a shared understanding, it's a practice, it's a culture. And what happens every day in the courtrooms are what people don't see, but the people who have said, I wanna be the change I wanna see, are starting to see time and time again that the decisions that are being made, the results that we're getting, are a result of lack of information and understanding about people in this community. And so what I have really been, an, it's been an honor for me to be a part of this movement 
It is a true movement with true intentions of the people who say, I want to have a voice in the tolerance of what's going on in my community. I want to have a stake in what the outcomes are for the people that need to come back to my community. And I want to make sure that the decisions are based, in fact, on the person and the human and not a biased understanding of who people or who we think people are. So I want to, um, as we go through this and explore this, we want to make sure that we put it at the forefront that this is criminal justice reform. This is the community's portion of criminal justice reform. All too often we've been looking at stakeholders, um, elected officials, policies, uh, and of course legislative acts, but we haven't paid attention on what's going on on the ground. And what go what's going on on the ground is something remarkable that I can't wait for uh, those who are going to step up and give their testimony to talk about the experiences they had and the outcomes that they got that I will tell you, not even the best lawyer with the best education, whether it's from Harvard, Yale, Duke, or wherever, could have gotten alone. So thank you so much for everything that you're doing, and I can't wait to see what's to come in Philadelphia. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Uh, Ms. Williams, would you please read the first panel to testify? Valerie Todd, Steve Austin, and Pastor Harrod Clay. Welcome. Come up to the witness testimony table. Have a seat. Please adjust your mic, bring it a little close to you. State your name for the record and begin your testimony. You want to go first? After you. Okay. Uh, my name is Steve Austin, and um, I'm uh, with Mothers in Charge. Uh, I'm also part of the Participatory Defense Hub there in Philadelphia. And uh, I'm here to testify today uh, regarding people, community safety, and um, communities. Um, one of the things that we've started to do with participatory defense, which is the title of what we do, is to help people first understand the process that they're dealing with. Uh, most of us uh, who've ever come before the criminal justice system find ourselves way in over our head. The system is so big, it's so large, there's, there's just no way for a person to understand all the things they need to know to help themselves. So the community is involved in trying to help people understand what they need to know first and foremost in the process. When they get an attorney, the attorney doesn't know much about the individual and largely in part because he probably has a, a hell of a schedule, a, a, a hell of a caseload. He probably has a large number of cases. And so much the same for the district attorney. He's not really in touch with who this person is. And uh, also the judge. Uh, these, uh, this information is something that may come to them later but the community knows who these individuals are. They live among us, they work among us. Families, friends that come to the hub help us to understand who they are. So we get a true insight as to these, who these people are and what they, where they come from. So when you talk about public safety, public safety is important for all of us but the community understands what they need to be safe as well. And I think that just relying on the police, the district attorney, and the judge, the law enforcement gatekeepers basically, you know, to see them only as the charges that are before them, there's no balance. There's no balance in the process. But now you have communities stepping up, willing to help and assist with the process. They're not saying that we can cure everything or that we have all of the answers. But we're saying that this burden that you have, you know, when you put policies on us 
uh, in our communities and tell us what public safety is, tell us what our communities need, we're saying we should have a say. We're saying we should be a part of the solution. We're willing to be a part of the solution. So to that extent, why not give us a chance to be a part of the solution? Um, we have uh, good people who come from the community, you know, from all walk of life. You know, you, you, you say, you name what it is or what walk of life a person can come from, and they're there. They're in our hubs. They're there attentively. They're there to participate and be involved and to help with the process. But more importantly, it gives us a chance to help the individual's attorney. It gives us a chance to help the district attorney understand who this person is. And in turn, between the two of them, they can help the judge know who this person is. So when we talk about uh, what type of sentencing, what type of punishment, uh, what keeps us safe, you know, what helps the community, we're there to have some input. And we'd like an opportunity to continue to have that input because people have been responding to the hubs. They've been responding and coming out, and those, even those that are incarcerated that cannot come, their families are coming. Their families are coming because, like I said in the beginning, they don't understand the system. And so the community is reaching out. The community is reaching out for help. They're saying, what can I do? How can I help myself? My son, my daughter, is not as bad as people are saying they are. They're not just what is in front or the charges that you see about this person. They're saying, my son is more than that. My daughter is more than that. And we're saying, let's explore that. When they come to the hub, we're saying, okay, tell us. Let's see. Let's see how. Let's see where. And this is information that we can relay. This is information that we'll painstakingly put together, you know, and put it forward to his attorney so that the attorney gets a better, a better idea, you know. And I mind you, an, an overworked attorney, you know, an attorney that really doesn't have time to put all this information together, doesn't have time to go out and gather all of these things. So in that way, the community is saying, don't lock us out, you know, put us into the process. You know, use us. We're there. We can help. You know, and you shouldn't shoulder this whole burden on your own. You know, you make policies, and then sometimes it's, it's easier if you ask me to eat the bread than if you shove it down my throat. On that note, is, is there a question uh, period, or is there <laughs> well, what, some? Well, what we will do is allow each member of the panel to give their testimony and then ask questions of that panel, if that's okay. Everyone. All right? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, Councilman Jones, members of the uh, Special Committee on uh, Criminal Justice Reform. Takia Bradford Gray. I am Reverend Harrod Emmanuel Clay, Jr., the pastor of the Mount Zion Baptist Church and uh, the leader of the Metamorphoses uh, group. We're also a part of Mothers in Charge with Dorothy Johnson Spite and uh, Robert Blair. We've been uh, working with our chief defender as a part of the hub uh, at Mothers in Charge since March. And we've met each Tuesday roughly from 5 to 8 p.m. We've had numerous cases that we've worked on, partnering with families, uh, some of whom have loved ones who are up on State Road, some of whom have loved ones who, uh, thanks to the efforts of our district attorney and our public defender's office, have been able to get out because they don't have extraordinarily high bails. Uh, we're appreciative of the leadership of our chief defender 
and uh, Kavita Goyle and those public defenders who are working with her, first of all, to conduct numerous Know Your Systems training uh, seminars. Um, these are not simply Know Your Rights, but uh, they've conducted numerous trainings around knowing your system or systems. So what is the difference between a preliminary hearing uh, versus a pretrial conference versus trial? And as a result of that, the community is now better informed as to how to get the best outcome from the criminal justice system. Uh, this morning, we were at the Criminal Justice Center and joined uh, one judge in working with three different public defenders to see three individuals released from the Criminal Justice Center today. And so we're also appreciative of our city's efforts um, in reducing the prison population. And so we worked with one judge and three different public defenders to see three individuals released today. Um, we have here today an individual who will testify that as a result of our hub's efforts, um, the judge said when she took responsibility for her actions and made her plea, that her allocution or her statement taking responsibility for her actions was the best that he had heard. And so we have individuals who are again beginning to find credibility in our criminal justice system. If we can demonstrate to the individuals who have guns that Lady Justice is really blindfolded, and we have not poked holes in her blindfold, that she is really blindfolded and justice is a matter of equity, then instead of them using guns to solve their beefs, guns to solve their conflicts, we are convinced and we are hearing that they are finding credibility with the community leaders who are working in courtrooms, working in these hubs, and instead of solving their problems because they distrust the system, they're now coming to us and saying, we need you to help us mediate our problems. You have credibility with us because you're working with us on our cases. You're helping us to become better educated. And so whether you're the judge, the district attorney, the assistant district attorney, the public defender, whether you are the complainant or the defendant, one thing is for sure, we are all a part of this city. We are all a part of this community. And the solution is right here in this room. And it's the persons who are testifying who are not talking about the problem, but are a part of the solution by the work that we are doing every day. I'll conclude with, uh, in addition to being at the Criminal Justice Center this morning for three different cases, I'll be going to SCI Phoenix to meet with individuals who are about to be paroled. Later this week, on two different days, I'll be up on State Road at the five uh, prisons interacting with individuals. Sometime later this week, I'll be meeting with teachers at a school concerning some children who are challenged. And then I have a meeting with several families in their home. And what do I see? In all of these areas, in all of these rooms, there is a fundamental distrust of the system. And so I'm grateful and appreciative for your leadership, for your panel's leadership, in saying to the community that with hubs like Mothers in Charge, the South Philly, the West Philly Hub, with this participatory defense movement, that maybe, maybe they can once again have some trust 
in us that if they come to us, Lady Justice will indeed be blindfolded and they'll receive a just outcome. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, good afternoon. Good My afternoon. name is Valerie Todd and I am a facilitator at the Participatory Defense Hub Best Outcomes and at Mothers in Charge. But like Pastor Clay said, like it's so much more than that because the families that know nothing and somebody tells them, you know, come down to this hub so that they say, oh, you know, my, my loved one just got arrested and I haven't heard nothing. And we're able to say, okay, that, that's because it's at this part, you know, you're, you're right now in the arrest period before a bail happens. And they, they don't know that. They, they might have been watching TV or just feeling like, oh, my gosh, my, my child's getting, um, you know, railroaded or, or whatever. And, and here we are being able to say, no, 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 that's not what's happening. There's a process in this system. And just showing them, you're trying to navigate through the process of the system, as well as supporting them, giving them a hug, because pain shared is pain lessened. And that's what we do at the hub. And, and try to say, all right, let's, let's see, you know, your loved one from your pers um, perspective, so we can present your loved one as a whole person when it comes to the court proceedings. What has your loved one achieved and done? H high school or, or um, work, you know, their work, their employment, so that, you know, it's, it's less of a burden so that the, the person can be presented as a whole person in the courtroom. Me being a formerly incarcerated person knows how important that is. I can remember being more harshly um, judged because I had no support in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. And I had, I had, I just didn't feel, you know, the, the audacity to ask people to come to court for me because I was guilty of the crime. So I didn't feel the audacity, but I was more than that. I was more than this isolated event. You know, I had been through a lot in my life and, and I had made poor choices. And it wasn't until I really knew better that I could do better. And that's another thing that we do for people who are coming out, um, you know, they're out on bail and they come to the um, hub. We try to assist them with life skills because we have a lot of other stuff going on. Like you don't have to, you know, go back to the way you were living. There's other ways to live. We do that as well at the hub, supporting people in the courtroom, you know, presenting that as a whole person is what we, we do at the hub. And we've, we've been finding it to be very helpful. Well, um, I want to do this also for the benefit of the people in this room, but benefit of people who are watching on television that may not have a deeper understanding of what you do. So you are defense oriented or do you represent also the community who might be the plaintiff? We, we represent the entire community. Yes. Say your name again. Yeah, we represent the entire community. We don't come in thinking about guilt, innocence, or you know, uh, defense-minded in that particular sense. No, our goal is to assist as a community to find out, like Val said, you know, to help people understand the process. You know, uh, like she said, she was a, a a person who was in the system. I was also in the system, and I know that if I had someone to come to me and take an interest in my circumstance and help me understand what was going on, I could have made better decisions and better choices. I would have had a better understanding about the system itself. I may not have felt as bitter, as harsh, as, as isolated, as alone as most people do. But what we do is try to assist our community, to make our communities better. You know, I said three words in the, in, the, in, the, in the talk, you know, that I had, you know, about people, uh, safety, community, uh, uh, safety, I mean, safety, and, 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 and communities. You know, so that's what it's about for us. You know, people, public safety, and communities. You know, that, that's real. 
That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make our communities safer. So we're not just taking a person and walking them through the system and saying, well, okay, yeah, we helped you out. You know, that's, that's all there is to it. It's like Val said, Val mentioned how we have uh, uh, aftercare programs or uh, initial programs to help them uh, uh, change their lifestyle. Okay, but the city, that's, that, that's happening all over the city. Pastor Clay's organization, you know, the churches, and the, the, the things that he mentioned, all of these people who come to these hubs are from the community and they're all involved with different types of programs and they have a lot of different things going on. We invite the people to change their lives, you know, to come and get involved in some of these programs that we have going on so that you can start a new life so that you can start to do things differently. Hopefully, by then, we've restored some of the trust for the system, as Pastor Clay said. Chair, Chair recognizes Ms. Gray. So I think one of the things that the councilman is attempting to understand is the whole picture. You've been involved in this, so you really understand what it is. Um, from my vantage point, it's also an empowerment tool, right? So there are times where our system, and they're still that way, really doesn't make a lot of differentiation between the people that come through it in the very beginning. So we start to make decisions about what should happen to people. Should you get bail? Should you be detained? Should you go through this process? And let's figure out on the end as to how we can make you better. And we call that re-entry. And all the while, while people are sitting in jail, whether it's detained because they have a detainer for probation or amount of bail, they are becoming more desperate because they're losing what little supports that they had in the very beginning. These are the same people that are coming back out to the communities. And that's one thing that we have to keep in mind. A great majority of the people that come in go back to their communities. So are they going to come out supported with knowledge and also an accountability to what they need to be for their community? Or are they going to come out angry, frustrated, desperate, and uh, without any other supports that they would have had had we been able to build them up from the very beginning? This doesn't just achieve what we call just outcomes. This also increases public safety. Public safety is a practice. It is a way of looking at what is leading, the leading cause of the destruction of our communities. And it's people who are in desperate situations, people who have uh, problems, social issues that we can't figure out how to resolve because they no longer have contact or connection with what they came into. For instance, we did a hearing on um, mental health in the system and we were told that once someone comes in after 30 days, their mental health benefits or their public welfare benefits are cut off. When they get back out, if they're released on day 32, they're coming out with no access to those mental health So let's ride with that, that scenario. How do you help? I'll give you an example. As I said, this morning we were at the Criminal Justice Center. One of the individuals, to our chief defender's point, uh, has had some major mental health challenges. So Horizon House was present. I was present. The social worker from the public defender's office was present. All four of us went before the judge and explain to the judge the strategy that we worked on prior to court so that when she releases this individual, <clears throat> which is supposed to happen as this uh, hearing was starting around three o'clock, that someone from Horizon House would literally be standing there to take him to Horizon House where he would see a doctor, the doctor would look at his medicine, and then from Horizon House he would be taken to where he's gonna spend the night. My responsibility is to report back to the judge at the end of the week as to how today went, how tomorrow went, how the following day went. So this is an individual who is not being helped and is only increasing our costs if he is up on State Road. He needs intervention, he needs services. And so we're able to partner with that individual. He was one of two that was being released today that needed some mental health support. I'm certified in that area. Uh, we just had mental health certification. We've had training for our people. And so we're able to wrap around uh, services for individuals to help get them the support that they need. I would also add very quickly, I was up on State Road last week where an individual met with me and said, and also with Robert Blair and said, 
uh, gentlemen, I need to take responsibility for the poor decision I've made, and I am prepared to go in front of a judge and own, take ownership for my decisions. And so we then connected that individual with his public defender, and they are now in the process of taking that individual before a judge so that he can take responsibilities for his decisions. Once the judge has handled his matter, we will be waiting for him at whatever point he is released to our chief defender's point so that we can help him with employment, et cetera. So, so that was helpful. That's why you're going to be my partner someday. Is that right? You, know, oh, you heard it. <laughs> yeah, I actually, I get it. Let me, so that same individual standing in that line to go in CJC does not have that deeper dive of support from you, correct? Yeah. Are you still with me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, unless they, their family has um, gotten in touch with the, oh, okay. the participatory def um, the defense or somebody or they themselves. So now that person, those individuals that all of you have mentioned are people who deep down want help. Mm -hmm. that really want to take that life boat somewhere better. What about the individuals who do not want that life boat at all? How do you make an assessment on them? Excuse me. Well, you're, you're, that's true. You know, there, there are going to be people who might not want that life boat what we found and what I know from personal experience is that you also have people who just want to help, okay? And initially, they may not have inclinations of changing their lives. I mean, that's with anyone. How can you possibly know, you know, whether or not a person means what they say, you know, and that they're actually going to act on it, okay? So there's always gonna be people who are going to come in and they may have well-meaning intentions and they may wind up going south or doing something different. But for the most part, you know, we're not to sit in judgment of that, okay? Our goal is to basically move forward and try to strike a chord with the good in this person and to do what we can do best to try to help them make a change or help them make better decisions and better choices. You know, one of the things we do is called Thinking for a Change, you know, and it's a really comprehensive program, you know, that allows us to get into the person's decision-making process, okay? So, but there are always going to be people who, for whatever reason, makes decisions that are just not, you know, uh, in their best so interest. before I go to Julie, I just want to know, I heard what you said about seeking out that person's better side of themselves and trying to pull that out. What happens when that person that sits across from you says, I know what you're offering me. I don't want it. I'm about this life. So do you ever run across that individual? I've come, you know, working in um, PIC, Philadelphia Industrial Correctional Center, a lot of people come to class just to get off the block. And after, after several classes of teaching problem solving, cognitive self change, and social skills, a lot of people actually don't know better. They actually think there's power in the gun, power, until you're able to introduce the power of living an honest way. You know, getting in touch with just an ordinary life, something that seems outlandish to them, can actually become something that they're like, wow. You know, when you're saying this is a better quality of life, living an honest life, not running from cops, not, you know, making dishonest choices, they, and, and actually coming to terms with saying, man, this is a better quality of life. Lay it, not having to have two Mercedes Benz and a five um, bedroom home in order to be a success, where in society, some of, some of um, social media or just, uh, magazines, TV is telling you that this is what a successful life is and actually being re reintroduced to something as, as a successful life is put in your head on your pillow because right now you're, you're in jail with no pillow and 
a successful life is putting your head on your pillow with no regrets because of the good choices you made that day and actually re I'm introducing them to that for the first time because they come from a fatherless home or their aunt raised them, no parents at home, or their, their family was on drugs, or they had both parents and were still neglected. So I, I, I'm going to let it go, but I just want to say I understand, again, for the third time, you're looking for the better side of that soul. What happens when the young man that you dealt with that comes in Judge DeLeon's court, what do you say when you know in your heart that ain't what this individual wants? Steve, can you what hold on one second? Say? May, I, may I put this in context? Participatory defense is what we're talking about. And these are participants. They're not so they're volunteers. mandated. So they've made the Anyone choice. that comes to that hub is making the choice to do something right. different. Right. So we want to make sure we keep this in context right. to participatory defense exactly because it can go right. off right. into reentry right. and all these other areas. We need to keep it to the concept yes. of what we're trying to do. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and that's exactly and what I was going to tell I'm you. I'm the slow sir. kid on the panel. And the people that come to I us want to come to us. They, they, they want to be there. And to councilman, to your question about someone who seemingly doesn't want help, I have never met a person who didn't want help. I have met people who have given up. I have met people who've quit. I have met people who've been so traumatized that their exterior message is that I don't want help. But I have met those same people who when given the opportunity to know their name and hear their story, those same people see other people getting help, see other people getting real on the ground solutions, and those same people who seemingly didn't want help now want help. I'm bringing to court this week, an individual, a judge assigned to me, that individual seemingly didn't want the help that the judge was offering him. But with some time, he couldn't get to his GED class. The judge required him to get to his GED class because of his crime, because of his record. He could not get a job to get the money to get to his GED class. As soon as he has now the money to get to his GED class, the same young man is now coming to court going to his GD classes and working on a, getting a job. I have met people who are so traumatized that they've given up and seemingly don't want help, but with interventions like this hub and other hubs, we are seeing the, the, the situation turn around. So uh, I have to briefly step out, um, and my apologies for that. But before I go, I just wanted to actually thank the Chief Defender and her team. I had the opportunity to attend a session at the Circle of Hub Hope Hub uh, a few weeks ago, and it was an incredibly powerful experience, and I hope that's something uh, the panels will talk a little bit about more. I was supposed to be a fly on the wall just observing, and it was very, very difficult to not want to jump into the conversation and help as well, um, because they were coming at it from so many different angles, talking about what the individual was passionate about, about recent positive life changes. Um, and it was just, I think, the process that each hub engages in to get to who the individual is as a human at their core is a very important par part of this. Um, and part of this that, as the Chief Defender noted and other folks have noted, has often been missing from our justice system. Can I just put... Perhaps, oh, yeah. Uh, what is your relationship with the prison social worker and the uh, probation and parole department? I didn't hear the first part of your question. Your, what is your relationship between the prison social worker who is supposed to be providing the therapeutic uh, intervention while they're incarcerated and the uh, probation or parole officer who is supposed to be supervising an individual once they get out to your center. We help to coordinate those services by those providers. And so we had a, a young man who was having some challenges with his probation officer. And so we accompanied him to the meeting with his probation officer because they were having trouble understanding each other and communicating. And so we became sort of a mediator for that uh, meeting. So we, we're coordinating those services by those individuals. And in many instances, as I said today, with the mental health case, we are 
coordinating and communicating and working with those individuals. With respect to the prison social workers, we usually develop a plan and send to the judge. It's called a parole adjustment summary, which you're probably aware of. And in that parole adjustment summary, it doesn't really talk about those underlying issues that you point out. Basically, it says he worked at such and such a job, he never got any inf disciplinary infractions, et cetera. What would, you, uh, what would you suggest to be able to link up with that individual social worker that's in charge of that person on that caseload when they get out released to you? You ask a critical question because we have the relationships with that individual's family, with their community, with their potential employer. All of those relationships, we're able to coordinate and make sure that when the person is released, and that's a part of, I, I see Claire uh, Shubnick uh, Richards on the panel, that's a part of what we're doing with the Pennsylvania Prison Society through a mentoring program that the Prison Society gives leadership to. Uh, tonight I'll be going with uh, Robert Blair and some other men up to SCI Phoenix. And so we spend an hour hour and a half with those inmates who are about six months from being paroled. And there's a young man who went before the parole board on Friday. I went up before he went before the parole board to meet with him, to talk with him, uh, to coach him. And I've been in touch with his mother in Nevada. I've been in touch with his uncle in California. And so to your question, uh, when we're looking at recommending to the parole board where he should be paroled to, We've been in touch with his family, and we have a sense of what the priority is, what the needs are, and we can have a more intelligent, informed process that is going to lend itself toward more success. One last question for the two individuals that have had experience behind the walls. Do you believe that family counseling beginning at the prison with your family is a way to reintegrate yourself successfully into the community with a support system? Yeah, I, I definitely, if, if that's available, mm -hmm. because like for me, my family was mostly on drugs. I never met my biological father. So my, my family wasn't something, I, I always say if you wanna if, stay away from slippery places if you don't wanna slip. And for me, my family was that slippery place. So I literally had to get a whole new support system. And I did that because um, Mothers in Charge was actually, you know, my teachers before I worked for them. I've been working with them for the last seven years. They embraced me upon release because my real mother had died while I was in prison and my mom who raised me as well had died. So a, a family support system I didn't have, that was non-existent for me. So yeah, this, that's why I feel like mm -hmm. it's very important what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Support is huge. It's when people feel alone that they get so scared and they're so desperate, like Ms. Bradford was talking about, that they, they do things that they might not normally have done had they have not been so desperate. So yeah, um, support is huge. And that's one thing that we definitely do at the hub. And I, I think people who, who case is already over still come back just because it's, it's so, there's so much support there. You know, that's saying, you know, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Okay. And that's, that's the important thing, go. yes. Judge Before the, the, can I just know, try to first. can I just try to shape because I think we're getting away from the concept of participatory defense because we can talk about the myriad of issues that people have but what does participatory defense do to help us differentiate now when we're talking about some of the things that we need to do at participatory defense is we're figuring out who does it need to go to prison mm -hmm. who can be worked on before that that's pre-entry. And so as we talk about people transitioning out of prison, there are a lot of supports there, but there are, there's nothing for the people. As we reduce our prison population, there's nothing. 
There are gaps that people cannot see that participatory defense is filling. And so that's as a person inside this system who understands the number of gaps and the things that are not even available. And Judge, you know, you make decisions based on what's presented to you. You don't know what's not presented to you. You don't even know what's, what, what could be presented to you. These hubs are filling those gaps of not just the sentence population, but the population, the pretrial population, where people are saying, hey, people are coming out of the jails. Oh, my God, what does that mean for our communities? Your Honor, I just wanted to say uh, I applaud the work that you're doing and these hubs. It's, it's very necessary. And I just wanted to bring to everyone's attention uh, an email that I had just received um, this past Friday from the King County prosecuting attorney. Uh, basically, he's the, uh, the district attorney's counterpart in Seattle, Washington, and I met him through this district attorney because the Seattle, Washington prosecutor is a very, very uh, progressive uh, district attorney, uh, just like our own, and these two, they go around together um, seeing various ways to um, alleviate recidivism. And what he had told me in this paragraph, and I brought this here for, for you, but before I give it to you, I'll read this paragraph in. Um, he says, I am the co-chair of our state's reentry council, and we will be pushing our legislature next month to fund community-based nonprofits who will provide credible messengers, mentors, to work with individuals while they are still in prison to come up with a custom reentry plan, then meet them at the gate on the date of their release and work together to execute that plan. He says, it's not rock and science, it's social science, so it is harder. So basically it's similar, and I'll pass this down to you. It's, 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 it's what you're doing. Yes, and, and then some. They're not just looking at people who have to go to jail and be sentenced. They're looking at opportunities on that front end. Pre-entry, Pre not re-entry. Re-entry, we understand. We have yet to begin to understand what pre-entry looks like and what it means to this city. We can't just reduce populations and have nothing else in place to help people make it to court, which was the purpose of bail, but also stay progressive and also participate in their own defense by making educated, informed decisions. You will never be surprised at how many people don't know when they come to a hearing that there's about eight more they have to come to. So they make decisions that are contrary to what we think are best for public safety because now that puts you in bench warrant status, sheriffs have to get you, all kinds of things that happen. They, people that don't understand that cash bail is only because we, we are looking at the person's opportunity to show up for court. The participatory defense hubs help that, helps that process. People come and get found, held for court on a preliminary hearing, believe they've got found guilty, and they decide to bolt. These decisions that people make are because they are of the lack of information and lack of transparency within our system. And we, through these community hubs, are trying to not just service people, but empower people. And then they, in turn, empower their own. And that's what's happening in your city. It is the replication of information to make better decisions at the front end from decision makers, but also from the people that come through this system. So we all share our responsibility in reform. And I want to make sure we keep that because if we keep talking about reentry, this is going to get lost in that type of conversation. Mm -hmm. So someone walks through your door, what, what is their experience? They walk through, they say, I really want your help. What, what happens next? We, 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 uh, we set up an interview with that person, and we call that an initial interview. And uh, we establish uh, what their problem is. First, we ask who recommended them. And if we can get that information, we always like to keep track of that. But uh, then we'll ask them what their issues are, what their problems are, and why they've come. And uh, we're careful to make sure that we have a discussion regarding the particulars of their case. We remind them that this is an open forum, that it's a public forum, and that you know the information that they give us, you know, is it should be the information that they want us to have, you know, regarding their particular case. Now, we are also responsible enough to understand that sometimes people 
you know, may say things that they don't intend to say or they may say more than they possibly should say. So we give a little cautionary uh, speech about that, okay, so that people can tell us just what we need to know in relationship to what their issues and their troubles are. So, and then we take it from there. We, 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 we have them inside of our hub and uh, we start to uh, let them tell us what their situation is, you know, and this requires a degree of trust from the beginning, you know, when a person walks through that door. They have to first, you know, that initial conversation that you have with them, it has to be a conversation that will, you know, make them feel good enough and comfortable enough to want to actually share. So we, we try to figure out who recommended them, and then we, after we get that information, we, you know, we talk a little bit about the person that recommended them. All of it is to, you know, to make them feel you know, that they're in a good space, and a good place, that they can give us this information, and that we'll go about trying to help them understand next steps. So on that note, further that, you made me feel comfortable. I trust you. I believe you are not the man trying to roof me. Help me through a series of questions you would ask me to find out who I am. Well, I think that's, we have a social bio, which is so important. The social bio is what presents you as a whole person. So they fill that out. Yeah, no, no, the social bio is like what your achievements were, you know, school, uh, work history, things of that nature. You know, maybe you, we have people who take care of their mom. They're the, you know, they're the only ones that's able to take care of their mom. Um, they've been working at a particular job for seven years or more. They graduated high school, they attended college, you know, they helped a neighbor down the street and the neighbor would like to write a letter on their behalf saying that, you know, they always helped me, they were always there for me, always held the door for me. To stuff that they might miss, that they might think that's not very important, we, we get them in touch with that stuff. Because some people say, you know, uh, I'm locked up for this crime, I got a background, I'm never going to get a job again. And, and that's it. That's the extreme thinking that they could have until somebody says, no, that's not the end. What else did you do? You're, you're 24 years old, you're 34 years old, you're 54 years old. What have you done within these years? And we kind of get them in touch with, with education, their work history, the, the simple things that they did. And we put that all together in a social bio for them to give to their lawyer, you know, so that the lawyer has more to work with on who they are as well as the DA, as well as the judge, so that they could see them more as a whole person rather than this isolated event. All right, well, thank you. Madam Chair, yes. Co-Chair. I wanna thank you so much for your um, testimony. We're gonna bring up panel two, which I believe can answer some of these questions, Councilman, because they are actually people that have gone through this process as people trying to be helped um, and looking for our solutions to deal with what they believed was an just undefeatable system. Samantha, can you please call the second panel up, please? Sure. Uh, Nicole Durrell, Zakia Salahuddin, and Isis Misteri. Isis is, uh, she's a public Aziz. defender, yeah. Sorry. Welcome. Have a seat. Pull the microphone a little closer to you. State your name for the record. And please begin your testimony. I'm very loud already, so. <laughs> My name is Nicole Durrell, and I am a past participant and a current volunteer at the Philadelphia Hub that is housed in Mothers in Charge. I was there for the very first meeting, March 20th, 2018, and it changed my life. Let me explain that to you. When I made my series of poor choices, and got myself in the situation I shouldn't be in. I knew certain things that I could do for myself to change my life. And I did the things that I could do. As far as going through the court process, I did not know what I was looking at. I didn't know what I was doing. As Kira stated earlier, you get to the prelim, you think you're, you're guilty, all you are are these black and white things on the paper, and that's it, and that's all. And you're trying to figure out, how can I get the judge to see me? How can I get the judge to see what I've done, 
what I've been doing, that this was a poor choice that I made, but what I'm trying to do to rectify that um, since that time. And you don't know what to do. So what I did do was I made better choices. I asked to go to a recovery program, which I did get into. Um, I was promoted to the house manager. Um, I was doing all these great things, reaching back out to the community to turn myself around. But now how do I get the judge to see that? And how do I understand what I'm going through? By the time I got to the hub, I was hopeless. Um, I didn't know what was gonna happen to me the next. I was like Pastor Clay said, just about on the verge of just give up because you are in over your head, honey, and there's nothing you're gonna be able to do for yourself. And I was not in a boat unique to my own self. I was sitting there with other women who were thinking the exact same way I was. But I wanna help, and, and I wanted to help myself, and I wanna help other people. So. I went to this hub to just try to suck up like anything that they could give me so I could learn about the process that I was going through. And I wanted to learn how I could get off that black and white piece of paper where that judge only sees the thing that I did, but sees me as a whole person, a, a mother, a person that's um, a contributor to the community, a person that has passions, that has desires, that has dreams. And you know, to basically beg, please don't put me somewhere where um, I can't, do these things that I'm passionate about doing. When I got to the hub, um, they started to pour into me the things they knew. They started to pour into me the process that I was gonna have to go through. Now, let me tell you something. When you get to a hub, they don't sit there and pat you on the fanny and say, everything's gonna be all right, you don't do anything, you just sit there and you don't have to participate in your, in your defense or your life. They do not say that. They say, get your pen, get your paper, let's go, you got work to do, okay? So I had to go through um, a lot of introspection in that time going through the hub. I had to look at a lot of things about myself that I didn't like. And I had to put them on paper for my allocution to lay bare in front of the judge in that courtroom. Why did I choose not to run from the time of the PSI to the time I went in front of the judge? And I'm gonna tell you, the hub because I had strong members of the community that were willing to pour into me, that were willing to encourage me, that were willing to empower me, that were willing to tell me I was more than just the choice that I made, that I had something to give back, that I had purpose, and I had no purpose. When I messed up, I lost my purpose, I lost my will, I lost everything. And I thought, everything's just over for me. And with their support, with the supports of mothers in charge, with the supports of the people that come around the table, I was able to be transparent at times when things got really tough and tell them, this is really tough for me. I'm gonna need some of you guys for support this week as I go through these things. You know, standing up in a packed courtroom full of uh, people just watching you and only knowing what they see on paper and you have to tell the judge in your allocution um, where your mistakes were, who you are, and, and where your real regrets are in front of a full packed courtroom. Without the support I had behind me, I don't know that I would have been able to do that. It was necessary. It was freeing, and it gave me liberty. And in the hardest way that I think it possibly could have, but there was a sense of freedom that day. When that judge turned around and looked at me, and he said, I see more than just this paper. I see who you are, and I'm gonna take a chance on you. And this is what we're gonna do for you, and this is what I want you to do. Now, my purpose is to turn around in the community, in the hub sense, and in the recovery sense, and turn around and help other people. No, no, this isn't the time to give up. No, this isn't the time to turn around. No, this isn't the time to go full throttle back into what you were doing. This is what you can do. You can turn around and you can go this way. This is where I've been. This is where I want to go. This is what I'm working to, and you can do the same thing. And just the people that I've got to talk to around me, I've seen major change and some people around me. And my purpose now that I want to do is I want to turn around and I want to help as many people as I can not give up, 
not turn around, not be so traumatized that they don't know what to do. But show them where help is. Show them where they can go and be one of those supports that I had, not only in the courtroom, but around that table and in daily life now. Thank you. Thank you. Easy. Do you want to break it up? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, I thank the special committee for hearing our testimony about participatory defense. Um, before I start, um, I'd like to start by asking all my fellow defenders in the room, all yeah. the staff who are here. Sorry. Can you state your name? Sure. Um, I'm sorry you couldn't hear me. Aziz Mizderi, Assistant Public Defender at the Defenders Association of Philadelphia. Um, I'd like to ask all my fellow defenders who are here to stand up. Um, I recognize that I represent their work. So if everyone could please stand up. <laughs> These are the social service advocates, the administrators, the investigators, and attorneys who actively support and engage with participatory defense. And by the way, these are the staff who could make it. There are staff who are now in courtrooms, at home visits, and out in the field who couldn't make it today. These are the defenders who've created systems knowledge and understanding in the community through the Know Your Systems and Know Your Rights trainings. It is the partnerships of our social workers, administrators, investigators, and attorneys engaging in client-driven, community-centered defense that are creating and finding solutions within the community where we respect the needs, the intelligent, and the leadership of the community. And I represent only one of many. I'd like to provide just a little bit of background about myself. If you asked me seven or eight years ago, or if you said to me seven or eight years ago, that I would be a public defender, I would have never believed you. I have spent the last 10 years teaching in New York City and South Central Los Angeles public and charter schools. I taught at the height of stop and frisk, where my students would be late every day or every other day because police officers stopped and frisked them on their way to school and on their way back home. I remember what a student said to me in a world history class in what was known as the lowest performing high school in New York City. And he said to me, Miss I, you don't get it. We get treated like criminals out there. We get treated like criminals in here. And criminals will become and there's nothing that you can do in here to stop that. And that broke something in me that needed breaking, quite frankly. And it fired up in something in me that I couldn't extinguish. And that ultimately set me on the path that has led me before you today. And I became a public defender because I thought that I could change this system from the inside. But little did I know that the change was actually occurring outside of that system. In fact, right outside the front doors, and I didn't know that until I went to my first participatory hub meeting. And I realized that I hadn't been getting it right, and maybe we haven't been getting, right, getting it right, this criminal justice thing. I remember an eight-year-old said to me in class once what criminal justice was to them, a conversation about causes and consequences. But we're no longer having a conversation. We talk to one another, but we're not talking with one another. And it is all, if not primarily all, about consequences. <clears throat> Causes are being addressed by the participatory defense hub. So you know who's getting it right? The communities are getting it right. Communities do what they do best which is take care of their own and each other, and they challenge their own. There was many a times in the participatory hub defense meetings that I asked very excruciating, hard questions of Nicole when she was drafting her allocution. And the participatory defense hub provided that safe space where she, like me, five years ago, four years ago, broke in her own way in order to rebirth and rebuild. And that's what the Participatory Defense Hub provides. 
Communities can provide their own solutions. Participants with open cases can provide their own solutions. In fact, that exchange that Mr. Rojas had today with Val about family-based therapy within the prisons is the kind of participation we're asking for in which stakeholders and participants and volunteers engage one another in a collaborative pursuit of justice and actually engage in real world reform and ask the questions, will this work? And I admire that because the answer that was received was, well, I didn't have family. But what Val does have is the participatory defense hub. And maybe that's something to consider about who can engage in that kind of therapy with an individual who does not have that family. And maybe it is about rethinking what family is. And maybe what family is in the criminal justice system is not people whom we know by birth and are related to by birth and blood. Because many of the clients and the people that I represent don't know those people have never seen them or met them. And maybe it's about redefining family as community when we're considering it engaging family in solutions. We know that policies and legislation hasn't helped. And it's because we're asking the tough questions in a vacuum when really we should be asking the tough questions to the people in the community like Mr. Rojas did today like Councilman Jones did today. Participatory defense has provided a platform, actually a stage and a mic for communities to amplify and advocate solutions that they have been talking about for decades, mm -hmm. probably centuries that are right in front of our face and we don't see it because most of us like me spend a lot of our times in the windowless empty courtrooms asking ourselves, how did we get here, and how do we get out of here? The communities are talking about these solutions at their local newsstands, on their front porches, sidewalks, barbershops, hair salons, mosques, churches, temples, libraries, parks, community groups, and community centers, to name a few. Only, we're not there. Participatory defense provides that outlet for us to be transported to those places we can't go in the courtroom, the front porch, the barbershop, the mosque. Communities in participatory defense, quite frankly, are mic dropping solutions that are better than our standard criminal justice response. Mm -hmm. They know how to get it right and they want to help us get there. Mm -hmm. Participatory defense is that platform, that stage, that mic for communities to communicate with us. It's not an accident that the two words have the same exact root. They want to communicate with us, guide us in making justice more just, outcomes more fair. And in fighting for fair outcomes, communities fight for a fairer system. And in fighting for a fairer system, communities make their neighborhoods safer. Participatory defense is changing how communities and stakeholders work together, and we're transforming not only individual cases, but also through individual cases, we're transforming the system, and by extension, transforming communities. In the words of a judge who I often practiced in front of, what she would say to the people that I represent that oftentimes it came down to, <coughs> quote, people, places, and things. You got to change those people, places, and things, or nothing changes. People go back to life inside in a split second, only to serve decades inside, because they didn't change people, places, or things. Changing behaviors is not what I do, or any of us do. It's what families and communities do. Changing behaviors is about engaging in long-term solutions. If we don't change the way of thinking about the system and who does what with whom and to whom and quite frankly how, 
what we may have little business or knowledge to do in the first place, then you know what? Nothing's going to change for us either because we're not changing our people, our places, or things. And participatory defense is an opportunity to do that. I think Nicole's allocution was a testament to that safe space that people need to drill deep, to find authentic accountability, and transform in the act of attrition. And ultimately, this is what I believe reduces recidivism. Judge DeLeon, you had read the email from the Kings County District Attorney. And I'd written a note to myself in response, in which I thought of this saying, if you're early, you're on time, and if you're on time, you're late. And if we are just re addressing recidivism upon release, we're on time, and we're too late. Mm -hmm. We have to address it before the handcuffs even come on, but especially when the handcuffs come on. And that's what participants are able to do at participatory defense hub meetings, recidivism starts there. Mm -hmm. it, the battle against recidivism of people, and I will quote the same judge, doing the two-step back into the wall over and over again, the way to stop that cycle starts here. As an attorney who has worked as a volunteer and referred several of my own cases to the participatory defense hubs, I can tell you that communities I've seen want to say in how their communities can be safe. The system as it stands now dismantles and disrupts not only families but also the communities in which individuals and their families live. By removing the person from her family, her community, we remove an opportunity for the community to intervene with a member of their own to heal and move forward. The system just doesn't touch that life, but every life that is connected to that life, including the victims and their families and the community members. We know that oftentimes a person can be a victim in one second and the accused the next, or both simultaneously. And it's communities that have the tolerance for these gray areas because they live in these great areas and among these great areas every day. The law, the system as it stands now, has little to none and at best some tolerance for gray areas. We are the people who are in need of disruption and interruption to wake us up and switch off our systemic autopilot. Each and every case I've referred to the hubs represents the kind of community agency, community action, community solution, community support. People are no longer alone, desperate, confused, frustrated, and quite frankly, dangerous. They find peace of mind at the participatory defense hubs. The facilitators and community volunteers are able to interpret the lingo of the system and walk a participant through every stage of the case. Volunteers attend meetings with defense counsel, help brainstorm investigation, write letters of discovery, attend court dates, often filling empty courtrooms. You could imagine my shock when I did my first felony waiver trial, and it was just me and my client alone in a courtroom. That's how their participants and the families find peace. And in the course of this process, it takes investment in order to find value in oneself. And that's what the participatory hub, defense hubs do. They invest in the individual in a way we just can't. And part of that has to do with volume, and part of that has to do with the roles that we play in that system but it doesn't mean that we can't reach out and collaborate with the participatory defense hubs when we see the limitations of our positions. Mm -hmm. And I am absolutely included in that. Community members at the Mothers in Charge hub helped one participant who arrived with his case manager one day arrested on felony drug charges to search for drug treatment options and enroll in a program. That was sometime in the summer he is still in treatment now and attends the hub meetings every week nice. with his case manager. Participatory uh, defense hubs have been places where people come for safe surrenders. 
The system cannot work without community participation. And when someone turns themselves in, it's asking them to do something so counter-instinctual, so counterintuitive to self-incarcerate, that they need to be able to go to places in communities where people will say, we'll pray, we'll sit and talk, and when you're ready, we'll go to the district, we'll go to your probation officer, and you'll turn yourself in. And at the same time, we're gonna put our heads together and see how we can get you out while you're fighting your open cases. I was there when one defender client walked in who discovered that he had an arrest warrant for an aggravated assault and he had just been released from prison for three months. I can tell you that I could not by myself persuade him to turn himself in, but it was the intervention of the community volunteers at the meeting who supported me and intervened, and where this young man found peace to go and turn himself in, having been outside for only four months. One recent case that stands as an example of what the community can do when given the tools and space, when the communities come to the courtroom and the courtroom comes to the community, is a case of 13-year-old Zahim who came to the Mothers in Charge Participatory Defense Hub. He was dressed in a football uniform, leaning back against his chair, his mom seated right next to him, and his mom is seated to my left, Zakia. I'll never forget when she first said to the group, she said, they took my father, but they're not taking him. They can take me, but they're not taking him. Zakia is a single mother of four and three. Four. three. <laughs> Sorry, I added one. And this mom described how Zahim had been arrested for assault, reckless endangerment, possessing an instrument from, of a crime for a plastic toy gun with a bright neon orange tip that ejects tiny biodegradable cotton or plastic orange balls sold for $3.50 in a plastic bag at any corner store hanging right above the candy and chips. This was Zahim's first arrest. To be honest, I was in total disbelief. I thought that there was more to the story. I came to find out, shockingly, that there wasn't. Where after Zakia spoke about the incident, about how in the police report, the officers characterized the toy as a black handgun, and that as a result, Zahim was detained for 72 hours. She had no access to Zahim during all those three days. As Zahim was being processed in the juvenile jail, he was strip searched, they drew blood, and shortly thereafter, he was ordered to clean toilets. You could imagine the community member's response, and I sincerely wish that everyone in this room could have been there to hear that response, that outrage of asking, first, how did the police officers arrest and mischaracterize, and second, how did the DA prosecute, and third, what are the policies in place in which Zahim and his mother would be apart for the first time in their lives? And it's these questions that the community members ask in participatory defense hub cases that create the very necessary and uncomfortable conversations that happened through various stakeholders and that wouldn't be possible without community intervention. After that meeting, the community members, I should say during that meeting, community members brainstormed with Zakia that something should be done at the corner stores that are selling these toy guns. And right after, Zakia went to work. She mobilized not only the Participatory Defense Hub, but mobilized her own community along with the Participatory Defense Hub to go to the corner store, buy out all the to toy guns, and get an agreement from the corner store owner not to sell them anymore. At each of the court dates, around 15 participatory defense hub members came. And it was this kind of support 
that led to the resolution where the charges were dropped against Zahim. And essentially, it was charges that essentially criminalized child's play, or what many in the community members during the meeting were stating, playing while black. These are not the kinds of conversations that we can have at trial, that we can have in courtrooms, but these are the conversations that we can have with stakeholders, especially prosecutors, with the communities present outside of those courtrooms. And that's what the Participatory Defense Hub members provide, is that pulse. Before I sat down, I Googled what was criminal justice in ancient Egypt. I'm Egyptian and Ethiopian. And the first thing that came up was that ancient Egypt's laws were governed by common sense. And I think that's what the Participatory Hub defense members did in Zahim's case. They brought the common sense. Because sometimes when we're so entrenched, we lose the sense of that. We lose our own humanity. And I'm guilty of that too. And that's where the Participatory Hub defense comes in. Participatory defense is ultimately a public service. I believe as crucial as paved roads, affordable housing, trash and recycling pickup, if not more. Along that same logic, the volunteers are public servants who exhibit the passion and commitment to work with people facing charges, transform lives, and reduce the risk that someone will go back to prison once they're out. And it's because of their tireless support of case participants. The community provides support and solace, and they, support, they provide a long-term support system and solution. You can't legislate that. Put that in a policy, in a court order. You can't mandate it. What we can do is support participatory defense, help the movement grow and flourish, let the process change us, all of us, from the police officer to the accused to the judge, and most of all, change the communities themselves and make them safer. So what I'm asking you to do with the communities is quite simple, to participate. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Zakia Salahuddin. Um, my son is Zaim Salahuddin, and that's pretty much where I'm going to speak on. I'm going to speak more on the juvenile side of this versus the adult side. Because um, we got, that's where my whole affiliation and dealing with this whole, my son's situation was. Um, back in August, my son was arrested on a Friday. Uh, I received a phone call around 8 while he was on his bike coming from his basketball game, he was taken to, was held in custody. Well, he was searched um, for a toy, well, a toy gun. Because someone contacted them and said that he had uh, shot another little boy with the toy gun. So in a black truck around 8 p.m., they went and picked my son up while he was on his bike. They called for a squad car. The squad car took my son to the police station, first district. I received a phone call saying they had him in custody. I immediately went to the police station to find out what was going on. I kept being told that he had a BB gun, which I didn't understand because I didn't know where he got a BB gun from. Um, and that he had shot somebody with it. Now, never did I think it was malice, never did I think it was evil, never did I think that's what he did. In my mind it was, he played too much. He up there playing around and done shot somebody with a BB gun. Um, we stayed at the police station until 1 a.m. Every question I asked about my son was, he has to be processed. I wasn't allowed to see him. I wasn't allowed to talk to him. I wasn't allowed to get his story or find out what happened from him. They eventually told me to go home and that they would call me and let me know when I could pick my son up. 
Well, 4 a.m., they called me and told me that they was taking my son to the Youth Study Center. So my son was taken to the Youth Study Center at 4 a.m. Um, I received a phone call once he arrived there. Again, I ain't talked to my son. I haven't talked to my son now at all in this whole situation. Once I arrived at the Youth Study Center that morning, Saturday morning, to sit with a hearing officer, they handed me his charge sheet, told me they were keeping him because only a judge could release him because he had a gun. So again, I'm thinking he had something that was major. Um, I'm asking my son what's going on, but uh, there, we sitting together inside this room with the hearing officer. My son said, I said, well, where did you get it from? He said, from the store. And I said, what store? He said, the poppy store. I said, this was a toy? So he said, yeah. He said, but he said, I didn't do it. It wasn't me. He said, mom, everybody have them. And it wasn't me. So I left there sick because I was under no impression that they was going to keep my son. So I left there, and from there, I um, contacted the family member who contacted the hub, who contacted the attorneys, who contacted. So a chain reaction went off once I made my first initial phone call that my son was being held. So that Monday morning, the district attorney's office had an attorney there. They had got my son released. That was Monday. The following day was the Tuesday where the hub meeting was at. Mother's in charge. They called me and said, we need you to come down here, come here. And needless to say, when I got there, I wasn't happy. I wasn't enthused about district attorneys <laughs> or anything. Um, and that actually was my comment. I'm going to buy him a lawyer. I'm going to get him a lawyer. We won't fight this. Um, but his attorney that he ended up with was in the room that day. And she started asking all these questions. And she said, you can do what you want, but these are the questions you need to ask that attorney. These are the relationships you need to know when y'all go in there. Do they, do they try juvenile cases? Do, do they know anything about the juvenile system? Do, it's not the same. So I said, oh, you know what, I'll come down to your office and have a conversation. That was about the best thing we probably could have did. Because the hub pushed it. They kept saying, go, go, go down there. And we got there and we talked to the attorneys and we talked to everybody. Now, through the process, the initial process, in the beginning, I was a little frustrated and mad. Um, but as the process came on, between the hub and the defender's office, they ended up being mad with me. <laughs> and that's what I needed. That allowed me to be my son's mother. That allowed me to worry about him and to help him because through we, a whole lot of things went wrong in his case. A whole lot of things went wrong in that courthouse. Um, we were being attacked. We were being bullied. We were being, my son was prosecuted without even seeing in the inside of the courtroom. He was put on an in-house detention. He, he was, where he couldn't come outside at all unless he was with me. I had to get permission from a judge for him to go to football and basketball practice. I had to, he had to get an advocate. He was prosecuted long before this case was even heard. So, and that was just the conditions for him to come home. So, I had all kinds of things happen during that process with my son. Now, nothing ever happened in my house. 
yet they sent someone in my home. They sent somebody in there to take pictures of my house to make sure that my son was living under a safe condition. But never, nothing never happened in my house where that should have ever been a question. And the hub showed up for that. When I called and said, they want to send somebody to my house, which don't just affect my son, it also affects my 12-year-old daughter. Because if something was wrong, it was going to affect her too. And she had nothing to do with it. But the hub came to my house. South Philly hub member showed up. Mothers in charge hub mothers showed up. So when she came in my home, they were sitting there, which caused me to be comfortable because I didn't know what happened. I didn't know what the plan was. Um, my son ended up being traumatized from this whole situation. I watch my son, he don't trust a police officer. He don't trust the system. And he's 13. How do he get that back? How do we give him that back? There was people who violated so many things and never allowed me to be a mother, never allowed for a conversation between two mothers that could have very well been easily fixed. And then later on down the line, we find out that the young man never said my son did anything to him. And that the young man, and that the young man's mother was a police officer. So, and that there was never a 911 call but the district attorney office wanted to prosecute this case. So how do we give them the faith back? If it wasn't for the hub and the defender's office, we wouldn't have never been able to fight as hard as we fought. Pastor Clay, he showed up. Ms. Dorothy, she showed up for every meeting, for every conversation. Chief Defender showed up at court <laughs> for every trial date. And when we speak of reform, and I'm gonna try to stay on topic, when we speak of reform, we have to speak about these children first. Because the children is what grows up to be adults, to not respect the system, to not respect the police officers, and not respect authority. But when you build in it, what do you want them to do? If you want to reform, you have to reform with these children. The police officers in these communities have to reach out to these. I have 63 boys on a football team. Not one police officer ever stepped foot on that football field. But five, they walk around their neighborhood five deep. If you want to help, help. Stop leaving these babies to fend for themselves and expect everything to be okay. We punishing them and they ain't did nothing wrong. We failed them, they didn't fail us. And the things that go on in that building under the name of privacy, because it's under privacy, that they can do pretty much what they want to do, because there is no guidelines when it comes to these kids. There is no guidelines inside of their court system. So it's pretty much just, let's wing it. And we can do what we want to do with them. And then y'all, that's destroying their confidence in the system. And they don't have no respect for it. But we causing them not to have no respect for it. We're making them not have respect for it. If you want to fix it, we have to fix the system that's dragging them. These police officers cannot continue to walk in these South Philly neighborhoods and these North Philly neighborhoods and not even say hi to a seven-year-old. You can't do that. 
It has to be a better system. My son should never been in a youth study center having to scrub toilets in order to call his mother. These are foolish, foolish, foolish acts that are being done and ain't nobody saying anything about them. And you have to say something, do something. These are 13 year olds, 12 year olds, 10 year olds, do something. Because it's not their fault. Um. <laughs> Thank you, Zakia. Thank you. Uh, thank Can you. Can I testify? She did. She did. Yeah. Oh, she, she went did. first. <laughs> Work with me. Do you um, have any questions? I don't have any questions. Just comment. I think what I hear you all saying is that these things, and Nicole, you have come through the system before. You've come through without the, the, the help of the a hub. And you came back. So when we're talking about recidivism, we're talking about knowledge, information, and empowerment that helps reduce recidivism. Real stuff, not a hammer, because hammers don't alleviate social issues. Hammers only make you fearful and make you make knee-jerk reactions and decisions. Not saying that consequences aren't real, but the fact is, is that when you came through the second time, you seem like a different person that's saying, I'm not going back. And if we're talking about public safety, we gotta look at everything that has happened, everything that you guys have just discussed, and the fact that you have built yourselves to empower your understanding of what, this system, what it takes to really break through this system, and you're giving it to other people. I think that's the takeaway from participatory defense hubs. The mechanics of how it works will be explained, I'm sure, by this next, uh, th this next uh, panel. And I really would ask you to stay on the mechanics because we've heard a lot of the heartfelt understanding of what this does to people and empowers people. But I want people to really understand what this is. This isn't just a reentry program. It is hardly a reentry program, right? And Claire, you, 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 I think you get it. This is a way of understanding and a way of practice that should be going on in every system because for once, it allows the public to look under the hood of the criminal justice system and figure out what to do to make sure that people aren't swallowed up, making biased decisions, and 13-year-olds aren't getting lost in the shuffle. So where they turn into men that are angry and have less empathy towards other people. So that's what we want to prevent, and that's reform. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman, for just a second, because I, I have small children that I have to go take care of uh, in a second. I just want to say that I was commenting to Keir <clears throat> that um, the system, the criminal justice system, is so unbelievably complex. When I uh, first moved to Philadelphia from New York, I sat down with the rules of criminal procedure and I mapped out the Philadelphia criminal process. And I started with one piece of legal paper and I ended up having to tape together about 10 to map it out. And I have a law degree, it is so unbelievably complicated. Um, and getting communities together to support one another so that individuals know how to navigate this system and what they're up against, what they're being processed through is so key. And my comment to Keir earlier was the fact that we on this panel we're sort of bopping around to other parts of the system, just indicates how to us it's opaque. Um, and so just here, and to you and the team, and to everyone participating, this is so needed, and just a million thank yous from the whole city. Thank you so much, Bill. Thank you. I just want to briefly thank the panel but I, act, uh, I actually wanted to say that I've never seen a tree grow from the top down. A tree usually grows from the bottom up. And the community participation that you're injecting into the whole debate about criminal justice reform is so important to this panel and to the citizens of Philadelphia and the visitors that come to our great city of Philadelphia. One of the things I would ask, though, is that you touch the hearts and minds of those people in the system because a system, a system operates with people. It is people who make up a system. So we have to touch the minds and hearts. I remember when I worked at the Philadelphia prison system, they used to call social worker Heine, Heine wipers. 
and the social workers used to call the corrections officers babysitters. How do we touch the minds and the hearts of those individuals to really have humanity? You can't legislate humanity. But when we had a suicide problem, we developed training for suicide. We had a use of force problem, we developed a training for use of force. How can we develop a training where we sensitize people to community and engage community? And that's a challenge that I think that we, we all have together. Ms. Williams, next panel. Akeem Sims, uh, Nupar Shardar, Bethany Stewart, and Chris Eden. Thank you for your patience. Please come to the witness table. You can pull the mic a little closer to you and begin your testimony, please. Um, all right. Hello. Uh, my name is Nupur Shreeler. I'm a volunteer at the King Sessing Hub uh, and a resident of West Philly. And I'm going to keep my remarks really brief and focused because you've heard from a lot of great people today already. Mm -hmm. I moved to Philly to complete a pre-med post -bac program at Penn and have worked at local health clinics in the area. I'm currently applying to medical schools while I teach full-time as a pre-calculus instructor and special ed case manager at a school in North Philly. Uh, they were actually able to find coverage for me today because they believe so much in this work and that's why I'm able to be here with you guys this afternoon. So through these responsibilities, I've seen many systems and... Pull the microphone a little closer, it's hard to hear. Thank you, yeah. Through these responsibilities, I've seen many systems and organizations that care for people. I make the time to volunteer with participatory defense because I've come to see that this model of engagement and reform actually works. It's also a very natural complement to the work that I do in education and healthcare. So this is specifically what I'd like to share with you today because I've seen this in schools and clinics in West Philly and throughout the city. In addition to the benefits that the other panelists have shared, I'd like to emphasize that from a bottom line, dollars and cents kind of perspective, which is not my natural perspective, participatory defense cuts costs, improves health, and heals communities. It works. Because the end goal is public safety, right? And we know that community participation and civic engagement and active citizenship makes communities and neighborhoods safer and healthier. The bottom line is public safety. So let's support communities in keeping themselves safe. For example, supporting someone going through criminal procedure is a safe, proactive, and productive way for the community to contribute to public safety and reform. For both volunteers and participants, it's a way to give and receive help. Whether it's finding and maintaining a job while you're going through this really challenging process, addressing physical or mental health issues, or helping one another make better choices when the time comes. In this way, this kind of front end support, right, as a contrast to the back entry, re entry, uh, sorry, the back, back end re entry kind of support that you might be more familiar with, this kind of front end support that participatory defense offers also directly reduces recidivism. The community gets to play an active, sustainable role in keeping themselves safe and ensuring best outcomes. We're all here today because we care about the problems in the current criminal justice system. Participatory defense is the solution to these problems. It's part of the reason that clinics in West Philly are so eager to work with us. We led a workshop at Serenity Safe Haven Outpatient Clinic just a few weeks ago. It's just a couple blocks from the King Sessing Rec Center where we meet. And the clinic staff actually requested us to, that we lead this workshop because they saw immediately how much it could help their patients. We're gonna continue working with clinics in the area uh, and we'll be growing our network. These are just some of the personal experiences that I've had that have shown me that criminal justice is larger than a case-by-case -case individual issue. We're a community. Our network includes the attorneys and social workers who care about these issues and who know how important it is to understand criminal justice in the context of the community. I'm grateful that this network now also includes each of you. Uh, and thank you for taking the time to learn more about participatory defense today. Thank you so Thank much. You. 
Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I want to thank the special committee for taking the time to allow us to have this testimony. Um, my name is Akeem Sims. I'm a facilitator at the King Sessing Rec Center Participatory Defense Hub. And I'm an organizer, but more importantly, I'm a caring community member. Community for me is an extension of family. I don't want to see any of my family go to jail. I've had my own experience with incarceration. And so that's why I'm a part of this growing movement of the Participatory Defense Hub. What it is, is a preemptive measure to redefine what representation is in the judicial system. Participatory defense is self-defense. I don't know about anybody else, but for me as a male growing up, part of the empowering moments for me was self-defense. Taekwondo, boxing. Like, even for a woman, you know, her learning her first experience with self-defense is empowering. So that's what the Participatory Defense Hub provides, is information, empowerment, and support. And the information we get is from a collective. This is a large family here. Some of the people that are part of the hub aren't here. I don't want them to not be uplifted in this moment also. Now, another thing for me is the empowerment part. Like these communities have, like I said, we're at the King Sesson Rec Center. There's so many things that are provided at that rec center and we're a part of that. We're a part of that. They embrace us. Rain, sleet, or snow, we're there. We want to communicate to the community that they, when they need the support, we're going to be there. Whether that's court support, we kind of do therapy, social work, through the assistance of some uh, public defenders. We have attorneys present also. But I think that it gets uh, misconstrued that we're providing a service. It's a program of support. Some people be lost in the system, intimidated by the process. You know, I went to a trial hearing or maybe a preliminary hearing for a mother's, uh, I mean a son, and his mother was the only one there with a bunch of police. That's intimidating. Like, so that support, like, and she gave me a hug. Like, I really felt that warm embrace. So people need that, that support, that court support. And we're, we're really adamant about providing that. But at the here, I mean, at the hubs, what it is is strategizing over what it is that you can do to be engaged and active in your own defense. That's, that's what it is. Preemptive, again, measures for you to be active in your own defense. And whatever way that we, as a community, can support you in that, that's what we want to provide. So we need additional resources in the relationships. I think it was, I'm not sure who, but we're trying to leverage the relationships with like Philly Cam to do more media around the Participatory Defense Hub. I myself, I'm trying to work with law librarians. So if we needed research on certain cases, they can provide that. The, the probation and parole office. We need reform with that also. So we want to make those connections and network, but it's just a start of a movement right now. But we need people like yourselves to be a part of it. So that participatory is also including y'all. Y'all are a part of the community. Recognize that, right? And, and, and really be engaged. Like I think somebody else said, like, people don't care how much you know today, know how much you care. That's what it is, showing genuine concern for the people within the community. Incarceration destroys communities, families, and communities. And that's what the Participatory Defense Hub is uplifting, 
families and communities. That's what it is. So I just welcome you and any other resources and relationships that you may have to now be a part of this, be inclusive in this participatory defense hub and community family. That's all I have to say. Thank you so much for your testimony. Good afternoon. Good My afternoon. name is Bethany Stewart, and I am a co-leader of the South Philadelphia Participatory Defense Hub, along with my friend Chris Eden here. Um, we wrote a joint testimony that I'm gonna, I'm gonna read, if that's okay. Um, I'm also a core organizer with the Philadelphia Community Bail Fund. I'm going to be speaking to you all um, on behalf of both of us, as I said, and I'm really excited and grateful to be speaking to you all about the participatory defense model um, because I really believe that it exemplify, exemplifies who we are as a city. When I think of Philadelphia, my mind immediately reflects on our city's mantra that we are the city of brotherly love and sisterly affection. And that attitude permeates a lot of the things we've done as a city this year. We are a city that won its first Super Bowl and refused to commemorate that win with a visit to the White House because we wanted to stand with women, black and brown communities, and our immigrant communities. And we don't always believe that our president does the same. We are a city filled with beauty and with an uncanny capability to see that beauty in the ugly, nitty gritty things. We literally love an ugly Muppet named Gritty. So the phrase that we are the city of brotherly love and sisterly affection really resonates with me when I think of the participatory defense model. What better way to love a brother or a sister than to walk alongside them as they navigate the giant that is the criminal justice system? And in, a, and in that giant system, that does not have the time, space, or capacity to love people, Philly's participatory defense hubs do. It has the time to recognize that individuals and the communities that they make up have been stripped down to mere stick figures when they deserve to be Rembrandts. Yes, participatory defense creates Rembrandts. It cultivates Rembrandts. And those that partake in this process return to their stick figure communities and cultivate more Rembrandts, Basquiat's, and more. This model has and continues this tradition in South Philadelphia. And as we continue to walk alongside our participants, we continue to discover their very practical needs and, to, and discover ways in which our brotherly love and sisterly affection can work to support those needs. So what I'm going to give you here are a few simple needs that would help to better support our participants home in South Philly and I believe across the city. We want and need the city to know about us. We can advertise on Facebook and hand out flyers, which we did, and hot cocoa. <laughs> but we also need folks like yourselves to tell Philadelphians about us. When a constituent calls about a criminal justice issue, will you invite them to our hubs? Could we have a flyer placed on the city's website as a resource? We need, tra we need transportation for our hub participants to travel to and from our meetings. Sometimes that's not so simple. We, we need to connect our hub participants to housing and employment resources so they can show their judges and prosecutors that they are working hard to remain at home. I'd also like to add that this model is much bigger than just getting people out of jail. It's much bigger than that. It's about reallocating funds that can go back into our communities. As per the National Archives, it costs about $31,000 a year to house an inmate. Nationally, the participatory defense model has saved participants over 4,000 years in time served. That means that the model, I can do simple math, that means that the model has saved local and federal governments over $12 million. That's what, 
that's a really big deal and a great example of what staying in the community can do for all of us. So as we continue to express our brotherly love and sisterly affection through the participatory defense model, I invite you all to participate as well. Thank you. Thank you. So you have a packet there. I do, yes, I'm sorry. Um, um, for the record, I'm, I'm Chris Eden. Um, we came prepared with some flyers today, thanks to... Can you pull your mic a little closer? Oh, and sure, sure. Let's state your name. Yeah, my name is Chris Eden. Um, we brought some flyers just so you have some information about where the hubs that we currently have in the city are. Um, I don't know how those actually get passed out, but um, if, you're, if you're interested, you're welcome to them. He's, he's right there. He's on his job. Can I ask um, one of the hub members, and I know you talk about this from a heartfelt thing, and I really want them to understand that this is a structured model that is designed to empower people to understand the, this process. I don't think anyone has walked us through that yet. When you come in, people ask, what part of the process are you in? If someone comes in and they're just gotten arrested or the loved one, what part of the process are you in? You then, they tell you where they are. You educate them on how to look up and access public information so that they know where they are and what stage they are at in the process. Then you go through and you educate them on each hearing. And so you give them homework to do as to how they can make each of those hearings go better. If they have a story to tell, that story will be told. And I think the judge here can appreciate that. Being in a system that is very large, that often seems like system processing versus looking at individuals for what they need and what they don't need. Now some people, you know, I know we don't like jails, but there are some people who have demonstrated that they may need to go to jail. But there are a lot of people that don't. And we can't make those differentiations based on how things are now. And a judge sitting up on the bench wants to have the most information to make the best decision so that they're not making a person far worse from when they come back. That's the key. They're coming back. And there are so many gaps in our system. People may think this should already be happening. What do you mean we're not connecting people, you're connecting people to social services? What about the prison social workers? Those things don't make connections at every stage of this process. And you are providing those things that help keep people progressive, help them come before a judge and say, this is who I am, Your Honor. I'm willing to set my responsibility, but then I'm willing to, not, to help someone else not come back because I'm not coming back. So I just really ask if someone could explain the process that you go through when someone will come, come through those doors. Not how they feel, but the actual process. Sure, I'll take a step at that. Um, so it's, uh, I, I, I think it's a process of refining. Um, that's, so people are coming in without a lot of systems knowledge necessarily. Um, and what we have, at a meeting is a little more time than they, than they have in a courtroom. So what we can do is, is combine the, the sort of storytelling, sort of processing they need to do with some very basic structure and some pointed questions. Things like, have you talked to your attorney? Have you talked to your attorney? That's a huge yeah, question. Yeah, that's a big question. Um, What's your trial date? Do you, do you know who your judge is? Do you know anything about the hearing? And of course, with just a few of those questions, we can start looking things up and tell them things that they don't know. Um, we can ask them to provide us information that they're comfortable sharing about the specifics of their case. What were they arrested for? What were they charged with? These are very practical questions um, that start to lead us down roads strategically. Mm -hmm. um, and then we can get into more specific questions that deal more with who they are, where they're coming from, after we get some really basic information out of the way. 
one of the things that guides us through that process that we're provided for by the, um, by the public defenders is a great poster that like takes those hearings, um, lays them out so we can look not only at like where the person is, but look in between the margins to what are good things to, to do, good information to provide, good ways to prepare at each stage of that process. It's a very, like, it's a very helpful resource for us as volunteers without a legal background, most of us. Um, and yeah, um, and actually, in conjunction with that, um, sort of a backup into that is a, is a training that we all go through um, that the Defenders Association provides, um, a Know Your Systems training. That's sort of, that's sort of the lead-in to participatory defense, but it's also open to the community um, for anyone who's interested in understanding how the process works. It's usually an hour to two hour training that takes that poster that we have in each of our hubs and goes through it step by step. What it does for us is it, is it gives people who are <coughs> volunteering at hubs in education um, and a way to talk about the process, but it's also just some, it, it does the same thing for the community, whether or not they become involved in a hub. Like, so that's information that goes a couple different directions, but everyone has a better understanding at the end of how it works and, and what they can expect. First of all, let me first thank you. Let me tell you why. Um, Kira has been trying to drive us to a, you, you guys, the one thing in common all of you have is your passion. Every one of the people who testified today is serious about helping their client. That is good, but what, would, what, what is helpful to me is how to be helpful to you. Yes. All right, so, um, Keir, not Keir, uh, Claire, talked about that seven page document. Yeah. It does exist. I have seen it. It is intimidating. These guys are attorneys and judges. I'm an elected official who had to look through that and say, well, wait a minute. If this happens, these three possibilities happen for an individual. So when I see those lines in front of CJC and I see them filing into that series of possibilities, it is mind boggling to me. Mm -hmm. So now if what you have done just now is help me understand your role. Yes. That you're the tour guide, for lack of a better That's word. That's a good word for it. Right? Yeah. That is a good word and for it. And an interpreter, for yeah. lack of a better word. Yeah. Absolutely. Of where you are in those seven pages and what is the, not, not giving them legal advice, but giving them practical options on how to best present their case. And one of the things we are careful you guys to say correctly. is that we are not... Um, we are not legal experts, we're not, not attorneys. That's one of the things we, we try no, and make clear each it. time. Yeah. He's on a roll. Uh, I'm on a roll. So, because she was, <laughs> yeah. she was kicking my knees up. My, my leg is bruised because she's kicking me like, no, that's not it. That's not it. You're not getting it. But I think that was a clarifying moment of what your role is. So now what usually happens for me in this role is I go out and I kick the tires. I'm a visual learner. Mm -hmm. Like, you show me once, I got it. Now, the reverse is true because now I have to go visit all of you in your natural environment of what you're doing so I can get a better understanding of how you do what it is that you do. Because <clears throat> that's what my job is from this committee standpoint, is to reinterpret that to the 17 deaths you see right here. Mm -hmm. So that... Each of us is not an expert on everything. So some of us have to take a deeper dive into a subject matter to be able to be authentic in our understanding of a issue and say, here's why we need to put money where our mouth is. And here's how you financially, there's some deaths here, they want to save souls. They, they, they're more, I don't know, I'm not going to repeat the term you called it, they are that, they, they, yeah, I want to say it, right? They are truly in their heart hugging the this, this system. And then there's some of my colleagues, what they care about is the bottom line 
How much money does it cost? How much money can we save? Because their sworn duty is to defend the taxpayer's expenditure. So now, I gotta balance those things to get nine votes for any given thing. So the more I understand what it is that you truly do, mm -hmm. the better I can then interpret it to my colleagues. So what you did today is help me to really get, and, and Kier kept kicking me saying, this is not reentry. It's pre-entry. It's not re-entry. Well, it's not re -entry. I'm like, well, what, um, what the? And, and something no, that I would like to, yeah, it's, to yeah, add it's, to it's, Chris's it's, remarks. Can I ask a um, question? Yes. Sure. Oh, is um, that, uh, sorry, just to add to Chris's remarks. Sure. The goal for the end of each case that we workshop for a participant is to have them leave with a concrete to-do list. And we're going to follow up with them on that to-do list the next week. Everybody whose case we workshop has a checklist of things that they need to do, whether it's collect a particular kind of evidence or, uh, or like, or discovery, yes, yeah. or um, to email their defender and to establish what their next right. course of action is. And I think that's very important to, to add to your understanding, Councilman, okay. because Can, it is a very concrete part yeah, of the mechanics. I just want to ask a question. Has yeah. you, is your exactly. office um, cloaking these hubs um, as to um, uh, the information being a, a part for, um, you know. So I would say we're not cloaking them, but we are partnering. Attorney client privilege kind of stuff, uh, privileged information so that this, they might get. No, see, this is why I knew this is, again, not. So the concept is not to give legal advice, is to give process advice, right. which everyone can advice. see. I get to do So there is no attorney client privilege when they are talking about what can I do to, do, to, to move my case or to tell my story or to talk to my lawyer who's not listening or to uh, get in front of the judge and show I'm a changed individual. What can I do? What are my remedies? What are my resources? So the only thing we do is bring what has been in our knowledge to them. And it's not a poster. It's a systems map. We map out our system so that we can re clearly explain from arrest to appeal. No, I thought I heard um, that one of the questions asked is, uh, what were you charged with? What are your charges? That's public and, information, yes. Okay, but you know, a lot of times when a person explains that, they might go into detail as to um, how true. they ended up being in that position. So that's what, it, that's what Steve, I think, addressed, and he said he, they stop them from going into the detail. Stop, okay, and so they, they keep stop. them, they're trained it's to fireball. say, stop. Don't talk about the facts and the details. Let's just talk about what questions you should be asking your lawyer, what you should bring, things that, of that nature. Things that people don't know. You, you know when we get a, a person that is arrested in this process and they have no one to turn to, they just show up and they say, okay, help me out. So this basically <laughs> um, helps to keep the cloak of innocence around the person, um, the initial uh, person that's arrested. You, you're trying to help keep that cloak of innocence so when you present them to a judge, they're presented in the best posture, the best picture that that person could be presented. They're not just alone. They're, uh, this is where they are in the community. This is what they've been doing in their life. So there's a possibility a person could be found uh, innocent based on, uh, based on, 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 yeah, on the information from the community. There is not only a possibility, this has actually been happening. Yeah. True innocence has been explored through more opportunities to partner with the community. Yeah. Myself, there's, I, I can be a skilled lawyer, but I may not get true innocence because I don't understand the dynamics of that community or what happened here. But you said something that, that was very interesting. You say we're, we're helping to keep the cloak of innocence. This is why this is so important, because people should have the cloak of innocence right. until proven guilty. Right. That is the premise of our system. <laughs> However, it has always been, our system has operated on a backwards determination. We, we, put, we give cash bail, and people sit in jail, and then they're later proven to be innocent. Now, there are some that are the other way around. We get it. But the issue has become, how do we separate and weed out and make differentiations if we don't know the person in front of us? I don't want to say it's just because we have a lot of cases, because actually the public defender's office cases have reduced. But even if I don't know a person, I, have, I could have one case. 
I'm not going to know this person as well as their family, as well as their community. So I need that information to give to a, a reasonable decision maker like yourself. And Judge, you know how, we, how this system works. You come in and it's a process sometimes. And there's often very little time to explore who people are because we just don't have the tools. They're bringing in packets of information that we can sift through and give to Your Honor. They're bringing in videos so you don't have to read, you can see it. They're bringing in new creative things to help people make unbiased decisions and give people what they actually deserve, not what we want to give them because we don't know anything else about this person and we're going to err on the side of caution. That is what reform is. Using our system for the people that need to be here and letting the community bring solutions for the people that do not need to be mm -hmm. in a prison cell for a very long time. Instead, they can be in the community, raising their children, being responsible, and being connected as well as empowering others. So it is so much, it's very hard to explain in this one setting, but I will say this, it is going to help change the trajectory of the decisions from arrest to sentencing. If we continue to allow communities to grow, be educated, and educate others on things that only were left for us. Right, but see, I also noticed that, uh, that it states are you on probation, which would mean to me that there's a, a re-entry aspect to, the, uh, to this as well. So I'm that's why I say it's more like the yin-yang, that you're getting people at the beginning, um, and you're also getting the people at the end. That you want to uh, that you want to help at the beginning. That's if you can stop everybody at the beginning, then of course that's the best aspect. But if somebody f falls through the system, you know of of you stopping them, then at least you have the ability to pick them up at the end. Okay, when they go through, I think that's what you're talking about when you say, "Are you on probation?" So that's the more reactive portion. Look, when we learn who people are, we make better decisions about what they need on probation. I've been in a system where we've been requiring people to get a GED who can't read past third grade. So when they don't get their GED because they can't read past third grade, they're looking at a probation violation. Mm -hmm. We've been doing things without the knowledge of what people need, but putting more in, in, in deal with it, dealing with it on the back end. When people are on probation and they mess up, you don't hear about all the good things they've done. You hear about what they messed up on. These hubs are providing more of a picture for us to go before you and say, Judge, I get that he use drugs on this date and this date, but he's been on probation for three years. Look what he's done for two years and seven months. So you're doing all this to make sure that Curtis understands. Yeah. I'm doing all this to make <laughs> sure that judges understand that this yeah, is a we resource. Understand. Of course, I understand. Because otherwise, the, the decisions are based on what you get on a paper. Yeah. And who wants to have a system like that? Yeah, so I agree. The yin and yang of our, <laughs> our, our process. Well, here's what I understand. I understand a person who, in between events, and I saw probation as well, had a 30-year record of responsible behavior, and then had an incident that triggered all of that old past history. Um, and without the narrative that you guys create, mm -hmm. That 30 years disappears. It's you violated. And it's like time never happened for those 30 years he was a parent. For those 30 years he went to work every day. Those 30 years he paid his taxes. And all of that is not in that narrative. So all you get is you did this on this day and you messed up on that day. And there is a big gap in between. So that, that helps me uh, to understand that there is more to it than what is on the arrest sheet, and I get it. So I want to thank you. Oh, yeah. yes, Mr. that's Rose. why I asked my question mm -hmm. earlier about your relationship with probation and parole, because probation and parole is usually seen as punitive. It's supposed to be a rehabilitative tool for you to reintegrate into the community, and that's why I had to ask my question, because we got to start taking that punitive away from the probation and uh, parole period. Because they will lock you up for any little thing. Because it's seen as a punitive measure, not as a method that's going to really help you rehabilitate. Your Honor? No, I, I agree with uh, what 
what the chief public defender says. I, I think that the, um, the hub participatory defense is a really, really good system. You know, it, it, it starts, it, you got to get people at the beginning. You know, as, the more people you can help at the beginning, the more um, uh, issues we're going to alleviate uh, as we go down the road. I, I think it's, I think I'm, I'm glad that you came here and I'm glad that you're doing this type of activity here in the community. Uh, and I hope that city council can help uh, on, on some of these shortcomings that you might need in order to, in order to, um, in order to fully, uh, fully, to fully uh, implement uh, this situation because, I mean, we need it. We got, we have to stop people. We have to help people at the beginning. The more people we help at the beginning, the better we're going to be because their families will see that they've been helped and that might turn them away from going in the direction that they might have went in if these people weren't getting help. So you, you need something like that. Um, it's, it's, it's something that's totally necessary. Um, and I'm just glad that, uh, that, you, that you're so fired up in it. You know, it's, I, I really enjoy, in, enjoy hearing about this. Judge, I'm really particularly glad that you're here today. Uh, just because you understand um, how decisions are made in this system. You make them every day. And so you know uh, how information, if they, you don't have it, what you're left with. And I know no one comes into this work not wanting to do the best they can, but you can only do that if you're given the best information. Mm -hmm. So it's always a good thing when the community is involved with whatever is going on in whatever scenario. Um, and so I like your quote, Mr. Roas, uh, most trees grow from the bottom up as opposed to the top down. And I'm, that's, that's my quote of the day. Uh, I'm gonna take that with me. I wanna thank you for what you do and, and taking the time to explain it to me. I, <laughs> We're gonna get him out there too. Yeah. So I'm, I am going to go out and uh, kick the tires, if you would, and come out to your respective sites so I can see uh, what it is you do up close and personal. I will also invite my colleagues uh, to come out. Um, and, you know, I noticed I don't have one in my district, so I'm going to be lobbying to get one in my district. You can start one. <laughs> okay. <Sure can. laughs> Who said that? <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Like the voice of God. <laughs> yeah, we we can start one, and I and I, I hope to do so. Um, but I, again, I want to give a heartfelt thank you uh, for taking the time to educate us. And thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, and with that, uh, I want to thank my co-chair for being here today, uh, and also this will conclude our uh, public hearing, and we will stand at the call of the chair. Uh, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.